happen once the currency situation evolves. We have a multiple reserve currencies. You're gonna see gold talked about more prominently. When you look at currency resets in history, there's always a reevaluation to gold. And I don't see that changing. And I do think gold's price will be allowed to reach a new plateau when that happens. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, February 27th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, February 27th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Rob Keynes, editor and publisher of GoldSilverPros.com, joins us today. Rob's premium quarterly newsletter emphasizes long-term cycle investing in the precious metals markets. He is also the author of the 2010 book, Drop Shadow, The Truth About the Economy. Rob's work has been featured on Yahoo Finance, Market Watch, Seeking Alpha, Gold Seek, and Silver Doctors, among others. And we are delighted to have him here again today as a return guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Rob Keynes. Rob, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Patrick. Thanks for having me on. Glad to have you back on. Thanks for giving some some time for us. Rob, I took a look at your Twitter the other day and I saw in big, bold letters, we are now a podcast. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, so we uh, people have been asking us to do something like Telegram or Discord or podcast for a long time. So we, we finally have. So you can find us. Uh, I believe on Spotify, and I think we're also on uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, uh, which is really cool because a lot of people just listen to us while they're doing other things. We thought, why not give them a podcast episode? All right. Good luck with that. You know, Rob, the Fed is hinting at seven rate hikes this year. Now, let's say each rate hike is 25 basis points. We'd be at around 1.75 by year's end. But the last high for the effective funds rate was at about 1.6% back in February of 2020 before it went essentially to 0%. Rob, are we going to see these seven rate hikes and will we see perhaps maybe only getting up to 1.5% before the year end? You know, they've been talking about rate hikes and talking about pulling back on their purchases and even running off their balance sheet and maybe selling some of their, their debt holdings for a long time, and I feel like the market's kind of conditioned to it now, maybe maybe has pre-priced in some of this stuff. But Patrick, I don't know how far they can go with that because we just today in the U.S. this morning had a CPI print of 7.5%. So we have high inflation. Uh, bond rates are going up. We're almost at 2% in the 10-year bond. Uh, we're getting really close to a yield curve inversion between the 2 and 10-year. The 2-year the is catching up to the 10-year. It's at one5 so there already, Patrick, is pressure on the bond markets. We're dealing with a massively overvalued stock market. Uh, it's now almost evaluations that we had in the tech crisis. It's more overvalued than it was during the Great Depression or the 2008-2009 crisis. So we're expecting a stock market correction. So how, in light of those things, pressure on the bond markets with rising rates, inflation, and an, and an overinflated stock market do for a correction, you know, historically speaking, is the Fed going to be able to raise rates to 1.75 and run off all of this debt? The question is, who's going to absorb that? Can the economy right now absorb higher interest rates? Uh, moderate higher interest rates, I would argue, yes. If they do a quarter point right now, I don't think it would wreck the economy. But if you're going to do that seven times, that changes the mindset of the entire market, and they're going to react to that. And I think the last time they tried it, uh, in 2018, the fourth quarter of 2018, we had that 20% stock market correction. So, you know... that. We'll see if, if, if they can do it. I think the market certainly expects them to do some of these things. But, you know, going seven rate hikes is, is quite a bit. I'm not sure if the market's prepared for that. Yeah, you know, you, you brought up a great point there because even if, if let's say, it's uh, 25 basis points, 0.25%, it's not really all going to do that much. Would you then expect inflation to continue to rise? Yeah, I would expect that well, a lot of people expect we're heading into stagflation right now, which is basically rising interest rates, no growth in the economy. Now, we do have positive GDP prints, but if you really inflation adjust that, it's not positive, it's negative. Inflation is now running higher than GDP. So, and, and that matters. And plus, the GDP calculation has all sorts of adjustments in it where it's diff more difficult to compare like a lot of government statistics are with prior periods because they changed the calculations along the way. So who knows what the true growth is? It's a very complex subject that that's not easy to answer so yeah i mean and, unless we're ha continuing to have growth that outpaces inflation 
you know, that's not a positive sign. <clears throat> and that's why I think the Fed is sort of in a corner. They're, they're sort of backed into a corner. They really can't lower rates. They've done that and don't have any room to do it without going negative. And rising rates right now just sends a negative signal to the economy who's been living on this you know, easy money policy now for about 12 years. Yeah, it's a great point. I'll touch on something you, you just said uh, in, in just a bit. Recently, we spoke with Gerald Salente, and he sees the Fed's rate hikes as simply a formality, maybe a political formality, and the Fed will likely cut rates down to zero by the 2024 election. I mean, have the rates go up, bring them back down by that presidential election. They aren't really rehashing an old playbook, is what Gerald said, and it's really short-term noise. Is the Fed, in your opinion, really hiking rates to give themselves that room to cut rates later? I think if you follow Powell, <clears throat> he's always wanted to do this. And I think philosophically he's different than a lot of the past central bankers. He didn't come up through that, that academic system like a lot of them did. And so his perspective on the economy is different. I think he's wanted to do that. He's wanted to tighten for a long time. I think he realizes all the easy money policies we have are going to have consequences. Um, I, I think a lot of the rest of the Fed is starting to talk about that too. The other Fed governors are starting to speak about this in their monthly uh, addresses to the media and saying, yeah, we've got to pull back. And some of the Fed members are now becoming you know, ultra uh, conservative in their views and uh, talking about, yeah, we need to run our balance sheet off when we have too much. So I do think that the Fed sees the potential iceberg you know, looming in front of the Titanic. And I think Unlike the Titanic, they know it's coming. The problem is, uh, and I believe Gerald understands this, is they're in a spot where they can't really raise too much. And yes, the political cycle does have a big effect on what the Fed does. Uh, the Fed is not truly independent. Uh, it is a politicized organization. And it, ha it has to be, you know, because the, the, <laughs> the Fed pre presidents and chairmen, you know, get, get appointed and there, there's an election of the governors, right? So it can't be truly political independent. And yes, there will be pressure of the election cycle to bring those interest rates down. I honestly think, however, depending upon when they raise rates, the market may, may smack that, that down by putting pressure on the Fed much sooner. If, because the Fed has repeatedly said, yes, this is what we want to do. But if we see the market start to correct, we can ease off. So they've given themselves an out to say, we can ease off that accelerator and maybe even apply the brakes. So I think that we need to look at the market's opinion first. But yes, by the time we get around to the election cycle, Gerald, Gerald's correct. There's always pressure to have more accommodation, uh, you know, for the new president coming in. Okay, it's a great point again. You know, Rob, with all this in mind, you know, if the Fed could only rate hikes to 2.5% back in 2019, which was the last taper, how high can they realistically hike rates this time, given the higher debt levels and, as you said, even a bigger stock market bubble now? I don't think they could get past a percent. And the reason I say that is you've got a rising inflationary environment, which you haven't had in a long time. You have rising interest rates and bonds, which means bonds are pricing in more short-term risk. You've got that looming uh, yield curve inversion, which if the two-year rate rises above the 10, that means it's danger in the market. That's what the bondholders are saying. Bondholders are very smart. They study the markets more than any other single group. And your first sign of trouble in the economy is going to be rising bond rates, and that's what we have. Uh, if you look at the rest of the world geopolitically, the U.S. is not in the same position with the world reserve currency they used to be. People are de-dollarizing. Uh, you have people moving to, to ruble-based contracts and yuan-based contracts and gold-based contracts. And you have people developing, you have Russia and China building their own SWIFT system for international payments. And people are not only getting de-dollarizing, they're getting out of the Western financial system and building alternatives. So right now, it's not as though the dollar's in the same place it was 20 or 30 years ago, and certainly not in 1971 when Nixon took us off the gold standard, right? So we're just in a different place than we were. And I don't necessarily think that you're ever going to get back to that 5 to 6% uh, percentage rate that you want to have if, if you're the Fed. And we know from IMF research, and, and the Fed has said this, you need the five to six percentage uh, rates in the system to be able to discount during a recession to slow a recession down. The central bank you know, wants to get closer at five to six percent. There's no way they can get to that now. Uh, we've been living off this easy money too long. It would, we would crash the economy way before that. So I, I, you know, I would say at about one percent, you know, that psychologically is a huge number in this environment 
in which I don't think the market's going to accept. I don't think they can go past that without having a very serious stock market correction at the least, and potentially, Patrick, uh, major issues in the banking system. Yeah, you're right there. Um, time and time again, we've heard how the Fed has said that uh, during a recession, they do need four to five percent uh, rate cuts in, in or interest rate cuts. So if, if we're only at one, uh, <laughs> could be some big, big trouble ahead. Yeah, but Rob, news of inflation and goods and services in the real economy, it's it's just rife, completely rife today. And there is renewed talk about commodities or commodities bull market beginning soon. And all of these point to higher prices in materials and goods. Do you think the Fed will always be many, many steps behind the curve should inflation get out of control? I think yes, because like I said, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They can't raise interest rates too fast, so inflation you know, and, and the bond rates are always going to be ahead of them. They're in reactionary mode right now, and I think that's because we're near the end of this life cycle or this current iteration of the dollar. It's not like it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So because you're at the end of this fiat cycle, uh, really the Fed's policies that they've had have really caused the issues. It's not just their fault. It's Congress's fault. It's, you know, everybody's fault in government along with the Fed. They're all to blame there. Uh, but yeah, they're going to be behind the curve now because we're at the end of that system. In other words, that system, if you look at history, is going to change faster, you know, before it basically ends blowing up, then, then the central bank's going to be able to run after it. And it was primarily the central bank policies that caused it. And, and that's what you don't have in the Fed is people willing to publicly say, hey, we may have caused some of this. This could be a lot of our fault. You know, there are academics who think that uh, at an aggregate level they can control monetary flows. That's never worked in history, Patrick. It's just never worked anywhere, that, that level of central planning on the monetary supply. So I, I, I think that they believe one thing, but the market believes another. And I think that the market is speaking right now in ways that the Fed probably wasn't expecting. And they need to be really honest with themselves and say, hey, how do we change our approach? Yeah, I guess the Fed is uh, too busy playing the markets during these, these blackout periods. But within the Fed, Rob, is is there any Volcker within the Fed who has the cojones to go ahead and push up interest rates, perhaps even into double digits? I think Trump was trying to get people in that were more uh, previous generation philosophy on monetary systems. Uh, more amenable to gold, more amenable to not just printing, you know, and issuing debt to oblivion. Uh, but I think the majority of the people in there now really are Keynesians in that they believe in the monetary aggregate and the economic aggregate management policy. So they believe that that central planners, whether it be the central bank, you know, Congress. Uh, can control the reins of the economy at aggregate level. Of course, it's never been done before successfully. Uh, you know, the market can can react much faster. The market processes so much information so quickly. And what what the Fed doesn't understand is you can't control individual action and reaction to things. Uh, that's why aggregate planning, you know, only works to a point and then it fails. So, but you know. When I speak to people that, that really have studied this for 30 or 40 years or know people inside the Fed, or I've interviewed people that have experience working with the central bank, they exist in a bubble. It's an academic bubble in which uh, they believe that they are the curators of this system, and uh, a lot of them don't have real-world experience. I think you have to have real-world business experience and markets experience to really understand you know, and it maybe have been alive during one of these cycles in which you had like a gold-backed dollar or a gold-backed currency. Um, but I think their viewpoint is always studying it from the central banker's perspective. So I think it's a bit of a feedback loop inside the Fed from what I can tell. And I don't believe they truly understand, you know, how the market works. If you're still here listening to Rob from Gold, Silver Pros and I, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Let the algos know you want more content like this. And if you want to learn more about systemic wealth protection, please visit us at www.silverbullion.com.sg. Yeah, you think with no Volcker 2.0 and no will to really uh, go too deep into raising rates, are we headed towards, let's say, MMT? 
Yeah, I think Powell is the closest thing we have to a Volcker, but he can't do a Volcker because if you raised interest rates to 18% right now, you wouldn't have an, a functioning economy because it's different than it was late 70s, early 80s, and our debt levels, current account balances, our trade deficit, we're no longer a manufacturing nation. We don't have the ability to support that kind of policy to deal with that situation. Volcker came along much earlier in this 50-year currency cycle. About 50 years is when most of these purely fiat currencies aren't backed up, basically crash throughout history. That's what history has told us. So he was earlier on where he could do those types of things. We're at a point where you can, I don't think you can go over 1%, max 1.5%, 2% on, on the Fed funds rate without literally causing the economy to completely turn over. Um, so regard, you know, I think Powell's the closest thing but I don't think he could do it even if he wanted to. We're just in a different stage, you know, the dollar's life cycle than we have been. And I think what we're headed toward is the ending of the world reserve currency status of the dollar. Uh, I've always said that the IMF and BIS want to get rid of cash. Now the Fed, the European Central Bank, China is moving towards central bank digital currencies. They want to get rid of cash. It's all in their position papers, all online for people to read. So I think once the dollar finally does die in its current state, I think that they're going to roll out the dollar CBDC, rebrand it. Uh, they're going to say now, you know, it's even more centrally administered. It's not decentralized currency like Bitcoin, centralized. We have control of it, and they're going to start that new system. The question really, Patrick, is going to be whether people believe that. Will people believe these central banks have the ability to roll out the digital version of the currencies and maintain them where they couldn't, the fiat versions? And that really will determine whether the market accepts that or we go to other free market alternatives like gold, or Bitcoin, Ethereum, or regionally backed currencies, gold backs, things like that. Okay, I, I want to run something parallel to the central bank digital currencies. And, and this goes back to one of your guests that, that you had on, Ian Everard. And he said something pretty astonishing, really, really astonishing to, to me anyway. He said that if Putin were to back the Russian ruble with gold, he would be able to do it with gold at about $2,000 per ounce. And he went on to paint a picture where... Backing the ruble with gold would do significant damage to the Western financial system. Rob, if this were to happen, what do you see happening with the Western markets? So there's a story told by Hugo Salinas Price, who is a very prominent Mexican billionaire who's been on a lot of financial media over the last 10 to 15 years talking about his views. He wrote something in a Mexican magazine talking about that China and Russia had told the U.S. and basically the Western uh, banks, we're, we, we're threatening to back the Chinese yuan, the Russian ruble with gold, you know, going back to a gold-backed currency that would put a tremendous pressure on the dollar politically, geopolitically, and in financial markets, if you think about it. Now, in order for them to do that, they, they have to have more than their stated gold reserves. And everybody believes that they do when you look at inflows and outflows. They're just not reporting it. They're holding it outside of their central banks and the, their sovereign wealth fund, so they don't have to report it. So we believe uh, our data that China and, and Russia are a credible threat to do that because they have more reserves than they're saying, just looking at the flows in and out of those countries. So if they did that, what that would do in the world's mind is, is – if you can back it with something as respected as gold over the last 5,000 years, then what's backing the U.S. dollar? Is it just our military bases? Is it our economy? Um, people would start – it would be a multipolar world, Patrick. People would start to maybe have foreign uh, holdings of the yuan and of the ruble and use that as the trading currency, you know, a, a de facto – you know, uh, multiple reserve currency in the world that would change things a lot. And if confidence is lost in the dollar, U.S. dollar crashes on the U.S. dollar index compared to other currencies, it changes a lot of things. It changes valuations of our bond market, our stock market, our real estate market. It, I mean, it does change a lot. And it takes away the ability of the Americans to export inflation, you know, in our service-based economy because people don't demand the dollars as much anymore. When people stop demanding dollars, our current system has to collapse and we have to go back to manufacturing because people aren't going to take those dollars and trade for our services. We're going to have to go back to creating actual goods to support our economy. So I do think that it would have a huge impact if that were to happen. Uh, whether or not that actually happened, um, I've heard it from a couple of sources unverified. Um, it is an interesting thought experiment. 
And it wouldn't surprise me if China and Russia have considered this, because why wouldn't you if you've been, you know, living in the U.S. dominating the markets, uh, the economic markets, using their military because of the strength of the dollar to project across the world. And you see the geopolitical tensions between Russia, China, and the U.S. You know, really the easiest way to cause America trouble is to not get into hot conflicts it's really to put pressure on the U.S. dollar because that's what everything in the U.S. is based upon, the faith and credit of the U.S. government towards the dollar, which is not backed by anything. It's a piece of, or a piece of linen. We see a piece of paper. It's really a piece of linen. It's, just, it's, it's cloth. You know, What's backing that? <clears throat> if pressure comes on the dollar, all of a sudden you see real quickly that nothing's really backing it other than faith. And if people lose faith, then what else do you have? Okay. Rob, you had me scared there for a minute when you said the dollar was a piece of, and you paused, I thought you were going to say a piece of something <laughs> else. But, but let's say Russia and China did do this. Is that going to force the U.S. to then put their gold on the table? Yes, and here's the thing. It hasn't, the, the reserves of the U.S., the 8,100 tons we say we have, hasn't been audited in almost 70 years. Official audit. Now, the government has said that they've done private audits and never been published, and as a former auditor, when you don't publish audits and your methodology and your validation scheme by an independent resource, uh, that audit's not worth anything in terms of uh, you know confidence. So we've never had a pu- we haven't had a public audit in sixty plus years of our gold reserves. So who knows whether we have them or not? We do have Alan Greenspan, former Fed chairman on record in meeting minutes that are still published out on on the Fed's website, if you want to see them, saying that they stood by ready to lease out that gold or sell that gold to support the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy. And if they've been saying that for the last 50 years, how much of it have they and do they actually physically hold 8,100 ounces? You could have a lot of IOUs written back to the U.S. for gold that we have leased out. But the thing about gold, Patrick, it's physical. You know, it's it's unlike real estate, which doesn't move. You can move it. You can remelt it. And who says if the if if we've done that with our gold, that we would you know be able to get it back? Maybe it's been rehypothecated. Maybe it's been melted down and sold. Maybe China has it. Who knows? You know, so so we don't really know what we have, and that would put the U.S. in the very precarious position of having to prove their gold reserves for the first time in 60 years. And China and Russia know this. They're not stupid. That's why they're making these veiled threats or indirect threats to do these things through their, you know, n- not necessarily in the press, but they're talking about it uh, through, through their political connections. And that's why they're doing it, is to say, hey, America, go prove your gold reserves. And that's why we think that China and Russia have way more than the Americans right now, because you wouldn't do that unless you felt pretty fairly confident you could compete with the Americans from that perspective. Yeah, because the thing is, if if everyone had a true accounting of their gold reserves, I mean, as far as what's been stated, the U.S. would have some 8,000 tons or so. But if you add the gold reserves of the IMF, China, and the euro area, and Russia, you have 17,000 tons of gold, roughly 17,000 tons of gold, more than double what the U.S. had. If, let's say, Christine Lagarde and her compadre, Mario Draghi, over in Italy, had to make a decision, would they then have to fall in line and, and back some type of euro currency with gold? And would this then kind of start off this whole new monetary system or even shift the power from west to east? Well, I think the backing of gold in the, the banking system has already been done if you look at Basel III. So Basel III came about as a result of the last financial crisis. And Basel III, in a nutshell, is strengthening the banking system. It talks about reserves, quality of assets, calculations, you know, how do we shore up the banking system? And for a long time, and I think the original draft came out 2012, 2014 timeline, and they were trying to get all of these things implemented for the last eight years, and the banking system hasn't been able to do all of them but they're trying to move it towards it. It's their attempt to shore up the banking system. Now, it doesn't provide absolute liquidity for the the central banks or the commercial banking system. It just raises the bar for them incrementally. And, you know, it's funny they haven't been able to meet all those increments. But in within that regulation is a net net stable funding ratio, an SFR. And that talks about quality of assets. It talks about the funding ratio you have to have for your banks and what you can use is what they call an HQLA or high quality liquid asset. 
Gold is considered a high quality liquid asset equivalent to cash in the, in the central bank commercial bank system where it's hedged, meaning in the futures market. So there is some price risk in cash terms on those markets. So they have stated that in Basel III, it's out front. And I think that gold is one of the major assets and probably the most stable one in my opinion that's going to be used, is used currently right now to back up the central bank system, but is going to use to recapitalize it. So we're going through a currency transition, happens throughout history periodically like clockwork, and it goes right along with the currency is, is a, one of the measures of geopolitical a ranking within the world, you know, as geopolitics changes and as the fortunes of nation states change, so to do the dominant currencies. So I think all of this underlying the banking system around gold has the framework's already been in place. It's been in place for, for eight years and they're moving towards it. And in reality, you know, once the currency situation evolves, we have a multipolar world with multiple potential reserve currencies. Uh, you're going to see gold talked about more prominently. I think it's been done very quietly, but it's going to become very, very prominent. And I think there will have to be at that point, Patrick, a revaluation of gold. I think when you look at currency resets in history, there's always a reevaluation to gold. And I don't see that changing. And I do think gold's price will be allowed to reach a new plateau when that happens. Um, but again, all the framework has already been laid, laid for that. I'm just waiting you know, for the day when the world realizes that and, and formally recognizes publicly the dollar's no longer the de facto reserve currency. And that's at the time you're going to see pressure to revalue gold because gold is what everybody's using to back their systems. And it's even codified into, you know, the Western system. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. may not have as much gold as we say we have. So that means downward pressure on the dollar. Yeah, some great points there. You know, we, we talked about some very significant life-changing points here where, you know, stagflation, inflation, the, the dollar being revalued, a new monetary system and, and things like that. Why do you think the majority of people just do not love gold, do not love silver or gold and silver just simply go unnoticed? Well, in 1930s, by executive order, which is unconstitutional, by the way, but, you know, people see an executive order from the president, they take it seriously. You know, the U.S. confiscated gold. Now, not all the gold was confiscated, but a lot of it was from the citizens. And then for a long time, you couldn't hold gold even as, a, as an asset, much less as money. And it wasn't until people were allowed to own gold again, but there two generations, Patrick, had passed before people were allowed to own gold again. So it had been demonetized in the U.S., and you weren't even allowed to own it. And it was a criminal act to, to have it, unless you had certain things like collectibles and certain classes of it. But the average everyday person certainly wasn't going to be able to afford that. So... We had programmed people for two generations to accept a different system. And so that's why people don't see gold the way they traditionally have here in the U.S. And there's even a cool thing in this IMF paper talking about the central bank digital currency and the currency reset. Well, they say, we know from studying history that you need at least one generation to change people's minds. So they know that they're going to need about 20 years to get people into central bank digital currencies and away from cash. Well, think about what we've had the last 10 years. We've been talking about digital currencies, Bitcoin. You know, so we're halfway through that cycle of where, you know, what you have to do is the older generations who only trust cash basically have to become a less of a dominant force in the political cycle so that they can't put political pressure on to maintain the old system. New generation has to be con conditioned to accept the new system. That's already been done throughout history since 1971 being off gold, purely fiat system. Uh, people couldn't own gold for a long time, but most people don't own it now, and they don't understand the class. They think it's, you know, an old barbarous, barbarous relic, as the saying goes. But that's what the Keynesians have been saying. And think about all the kids that have grown up in this Keynesian system. You know, I'm Gen X, and we grew up in the Keynesian system. The last people to remember a gold-backed currency were the boomers, and they're starting to retire. And you look at, in terms of demographics, <clears throat> the boomers had 77 million in the U.S. And in the U.S. alone, the millennials have 92 million. So it's a bigger generation that don't even know what the old system was nor care. So is it, that's basically what happens over time. You know, things change and people adopt new systems and, and that's where we are. So I, I think all of that's been laid in place really over time. Yeah, you know, this new system, obviously, it's going to be central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. What's your 
perhaps one or two biggest concerns with CBDCs? Well, they're not decentralized like a Bitcoin. I'm not the huge Bitcoin fan anyway, but I understand why it exists. It exists as an alternative to fiat currencies. And positive proponents of Bitcoin, I'm not talking about the speculators and scam artisan, which, you know, the crypto market has a ton of them because it's a new market and um, not a lot of regulation. <clears throat> but, you know, the private cryptos exist <clears throat> as an alternative to the dollar. The central bank digital currencies are not private. Uh, they are centralized. They're using some of the technology of the cryptocurrencies, but they what they are is a closed loop system and the government authorities control how much of it. So there's not like a 21 or 27 million coin limit, anything like that, whatever these private currencies have. That what it is, if you understand the research, is it's a system in which they want to use it to control aggregate monetary flow. There are two main controls that they want to use according to IMF. They want to use taxes, the amount of the tax rate over the long term to affect how much money is in the system and how much revenue the government gets. But through the, the traditional banking system and the use of central bank digital currencies, which would be linked then, they want to control aggregate. And so in the IMF paper, they talk about, well, you earn $100, but we're going to have a discount rate and you may only have $95 in your bank account before you get to spend it. In the transmission from wherever you're getting the money to when it hits your bank account, they apply that discount rate. So that's negative interest rates, not in bonds, but in the banking system, why? Because in the same paper, the IMF said we got to get rid of bond because they, the way they have to manage bond is very old and clunky and slow. In other words, they want to push button manage the economy. So the central bank digital currencies are very much a way for them to instantaneously discount the value of your digital dollar and therefore of your spending power and therefore of the labor that you use to produce that at whatever rate they want and control those aggregate monetary flows. Not good for individuals, but it's really a central planner's uh, dream. That's what they want. And so there are some risks to individuals with a central bank digital currency system. And I think people really should go read the papers and, and view my videos from last year talking about this. I need to do a refresher video that people have been asking me to really just walk people, you know, step by step again through this. But it's not a, it's not like Bitcoin. Certainly it's not like the dollar. And people should just make them make themselves aware of what this truly is, you know, before uh, they accept what the central bank wants to put out. Okay. You know, Rob, last question here. I recently spoke with Florian Grumis from Midas Touch Consulting, and it's long been said that, you know, you should allocate uh, 5%, 10% of your portfolio in precious metals. After speaking with Florian, he says perhaps you should be considering now 25% of your portfolio being precious metals. What are your thoughts on this? See, there's something in portfolio theory, just in general, that you should do like a 60-40 or balance asset classes in your portfolio and how that smooths out your portfolio. Well, if you put gold into that portfolio theory, you can go up to 10 to 20 percent. And over the long term, gold stabilizes any portfolio. And the data is is extremely strong in this regard because gold has tended to be very stable over time. It really doesn't fluctuate like a lot of the derivative paper markets do. Uh, even though it's controlled by a derivative paper market, it's been one of the most stable asset classes over time. Certainly over the last 20 years, it's done great. So over the last 20 years, it would have really balanced out the variations in the, the, the stock markets, the bond valuation, stuff like that, the U.S. dollar, Forex. So I, there is the case that if you want 100 percent into gold, you're removing yourself from all counterparty risk. Um, a lot of people are obviously don't want to do that, and we can't do that because there's not enough gold to actually physically do that. But from my perspective, I'm probably about 40 percent of my wealth in precious metals and then in other things like land and businesses and things. Um, I could go much higher. That's my personal opinion. Everybody has to make their own decisions there. But I see gold as a, a stable asset, and that's why I have it. It's basically a pure form of money. Um, it removes counterparty risk. And if you're about to go through a currency reset, it actually where I think it's going to be revalued, it actually then becomes more of a speculative asset. So in light of that, you could go really heavy gold, and I wouldn't you know, criticize you for doing that. Um, but I do think that there is, th there is case study within portfolio theory that says gold is one of your ultimate stabilizers of a portfolio. So even if you're heavy into stocks, bonds, forex, and the cryptocurrencies, whatever you're investing in, real estate, 
there is a case to be made for holding a strong amount of gold in your portfolio at any point in time, but especially during a time where we're going through a currency reset. Yeah, amen to that. Rob Keynes from Gold Silver Pros, which you are definitely a gold and silver pro. Before we wrap up, can you let the viewers know how they can learn more about you and follow you? Yeah, so you simply go to goldsilverpros.com. We have a free sign-up list. Monday, we send out a free newsletter summarizing our content, providing additional insights for people. You can go to Gold Silver Pros on Twitter or YouTube. Uh, we'll be doing more social media coming throughout this year. In about a month, we're also going to be announcing a new free informational service for people outside the precious metal. So stay tuned for that on our channels. All right. Look forward to it. Rob Keynes, we appreciate the time you've given us and the insights you've given. And I hope we can do this again soon. I hope so, too. Thank you so much, Patrick. I always enjoy being on your show and appreciate you inviting me back on. That was Rob Keen sharing his views on the economy and precious metals. For more info on Rob, please visit his website, goldsilverpros.com. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share to let the algos know you want to see more of our content. Audio versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.